September is Suicide Prevention Month, so we're shining a light on the effort in New York to prevent self-harm. And to do that, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Dr. Jay Carruthers, Director of the Suicide Prevention Center in the state's Office of Mental Health. Welcome to the show, Jay. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Dave. Well, for starters, Doctor, can you talk about the landscape of suicide in New York uh, right now? Part of the reason there's been more focus on suicide and and, uh, suicide prevention is that over the last two decades, both at the national and state level, we've seen increases in suicide rates, about 35 percent. So about a third uh, increase over the last two decades. At the same time, we've also seen major forms of mortality like heart disease, cancer decrease. You know, so suicide has been going fundamentally in the wrong direction. Um, it's been decreasing also internationally at the global level, but for complicated reasons, it's been increasing both in the United States and New York State. So we've got about um, each year about 1,700 New Yorkers die by suicide. Um, so you know that's more than die in uh, motor vehicle accidents. It's it's, it's more than die by homicides. Um, so, and then when you factor in suicide attempts of so non, non-fatal suicide attempts, you've got about 42,000 of those occurring among New Yorkers each year. Um, and about a half a million New Yorkers seriously consider suicide uh, each year, including youth. Uh, our, our youth surveys suggest nearly 10% of high school students surveyed said that they actually attempted suicide in the prior 12 months of being surveyed. So about 9%. And, and that's gro- also similarly, the trends are going in the wrong direction. It's gone from a little over 6% to about 9%. And then of course, you know, families, communities, we're all impacted when someone dies by suicide. Um, so add all that up and it, it's a major public health problem. Well, when you think about the trends, uh, specifically in New York, are there obvious explanations for the numbers heading in the wrong direction? The short answer is no one really knows for sure, but it's essentially been across virtually every age and ethnic group, uh, the increases. So whatever is driving it, it's not isolated to spe- you know specific groups. So it's a very broad-based phenomenon, I guess, is, is what I would say. You know, there's some... Uh, uh, inference that um, part of this is driven by uh, social media, but there's no clear explanation. Well, then what does that mean for the work of the Suicide Prevention Center? Because if you can't point to a clear cause that's driving this, how do you go about trying to to solve it? Mm Mm-hmm. Despite the trends, um, suicides are preventable. We do have interventions that work. It's a a comprehensive public health model. We know risk and protective factors um, that are part of the problem. But, you know, most people point to like the the most powerful predictor often is is a, a past suicide attempt. You know, someone who has a past suicide attempt is certainly uh, at elevated risk for suicide. And New York has done innovative things in that space to make uh, interventions more available precisely for that population. Um, but even that group, it's about 8 to 10 percent of, of individuals who don't die uh, on their first attempt ultimately die by suicide. So the majority don't. And many individuals who die by suicide, perhaps around 50%, die on their first attempt. So we have to come up with other ways. Thankfully, despite the trends that I rattled off, I think New York is taking the public health problem very seriously. And in fact, New York State, despite those, those trends, New York State actually has one of the lowest suicide rates in all 50 states. So it's a complex phenomenon. There's no one solution. We're doing a lot of different uh, things in New York State, and we've got a lot of uh, initiatives that are targeting specific populations at risk. So our CARES UP initiative, UP stands for Uniform Personnel. And we're investing a million dollars trying to, to in more what's called upstream interventions. So trying to leave people less vulnerable for, for, uh, to suicide to begin with. We know part of their risk is um, 
is attached to uh, workforce trauma exposure. So um, trying to buffer them against some of the ill effects of um, workforce trauma exposure. So a million dollars every year is going to uh, target suicide prevention in um, essentially first responders. That so that includes um, you know uh, firefighters, law enforcement, uh, police, um, uh, as well as uh, EMS workers uh, and corrections officers. That program is also targeting veterans. And it turns out it's particularly transitioning service members. When military service members are deployed from and they move them from one base across the globe to another, they have extraordinary levels of support and social connectedness within the military for both uh, service members and their family members. When they leave military service, it's called the deadly gap because they're at risk for homelessness, unemployment, and uh, increased uh, substance use and mental health problems, and including suicide. So part of the money in the CARES UP program is going to try to support individuals and very much um, modeled after what the, the support that they received in the military when they were moving from one base to another that may be halfway across the globe. So it's not overtly marketed suicide prevention, but it is additional social support to those that are at risk. Um, you know, one of the risks is access to guns. Part of the New York State approach is developing sort of culturally adapted interventions for at-risk groups. So we just put in $5 million uh, for programs for underserved populations. There's been great concern about Black youth, Hispanic youth. Um, Native Americans have historically been a very high-risk group. LGBTQ youth uh, also at risk. Um, so uh, Asian Americans. So, so there are specific programs that are been culturally adapted to uh, provide additional support for at-risk populations. We've been doing some pilot work in Black churches that I'm happy to report is expanding. Obviously, there's been a lot of concern about youth suicide prevention. So part of the OMH response has been investing in, in expansion of school-based mental health clinics now that are currently at about 1,000 across the state and uh, three Point four million million are being put into expanding that program. So part of the concern about uh, mental health youth is that we've seen increases in adolescents presenting to emergency rooms, particularly adolescent girls. And that's New York State and national data have, have shown the same kind of alarming trends. Um, I'm happy to report that we just heard that we were getting a CDC grant award that's going to be started in the Capital District that's going to be targeted targeting in part adolescents, including adolescent girls, because of that data. And because regionally, we saw um, the biggest increases in the capital district. Um, so suicide attempts among young people is a concern that we're trying to address. Um, and part of it, I think, is around social connectedness. We now know, you know, this is sort of, there's a robust literature that loneliness and social isolation can uh, put people at increased risk. So we really know that connection, social connectedness is emerging as an important protective factor for mental well-being, suicide prevention, even physical health is impacted by, you know, loneliness and social isolation. Well, I'm curious about the safety net that emerges after someone does attempt a suicide and they're unsuccessful. What is put into place for that person to try to prevent a second attempt? Um, that's a great question. But let me first just kind of be a little nitpicky about the language, because I do think the language we talk about matters. I know for years, it, it, you know, look, I'm the director of the Suicide Prevention Center at OMH. And it took me years not to say committed suicide. Uh, we, we've sort of replaced that with um, an individual died by suicide instead of committed suicide because of the connotations attached to criminal behavior. Does the person who died by suicide care about that? Um, well, I think I think there is so much stigma. Um, clearly, uh, there's nothing we can do to... Um, to help that person, but but there is a ton of stigma around suicide and mental health. So, and I think the language matters. So e even uh, what did you say? Sort of uh, 
unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. I think a better, better way to approach it is sort of non-lethal attempt or non-fatal. Um, I know it's sort of nitpicky and technical, but, but I do think the language matters and, okay. and it can be helpful in terms of engaging people that are vulnerable. So the safety net then that emerges, it, what, what are the services available for someone after uh, an attempt? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, we're trying to make sort of innovative approaches uh, specifically for that population because they still, uh, as we talked about earlier, um, someone of the past suicide attempt, particularly in the in the um, 90 days, even year after they had a suicide attempt, that's a particularly high risk time. So it's important that we have empirically supported, you know, make empirically supported uh, interventions available. One of them that we've been trying to make available is called ASAP, Attempted Suicide Short Intervention Program. It's a three session intervention um, that um, for adults only who have had a recent suicide attempt. Um, and in, it, it was developed in Switzerland where the original randomized controlled trial showed a redu- reduction in repeat suicide attempts of um, 80%. It also reduced hospital days, both medical and psychiatric, um, by over 70%. So we're trying to replicate those findings in New York State. And so we've uh, right now, it, there is a trial going on. Uh, we have teams in Rochester and Syracuse that are making that available. It's available through uh, telepsych. Um, so it, it's not just, a, you know, so it can be made uh, more broadly available than just those communities, Rochester and Syracuse. So, so that's one answer. Um, another on the child side, there's something called Youth Nominated Support Team, YST. What's novel about YST is that the intervention is not actually directed so towards the um, distressed youth. The original trial was was with adolescents that were admitted to inpatient psychiatric units, and um, the control arm got usual care, and then the intervention arm got something called YST, where the adolescent nominates three to four trusted adults that they want on their team. Um, it's usually in a, a parent plus two or three other people, could be a coach, teacher, clergy in person, another family member, but... Um, the YST therapist meets not with the, uh, initially they meet with the, with the child. And then um, after the patient is discharged or after the adolescent leaves the hospital, um, the YST therapist basically support coaches and supports the support team of the youth for weekly. They do week, weekly sort of calls for about three months. And in a trial here, they showed um, significant reduction in deaths after following kids for 12, on average, 12 years. Um, the YST group did much better. And again, this is a theme like social connectedness, social support matters. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out why, but sort of um, that's, and it's being explored, but in terms of the really nitty gritty mechanisms, but one theory is that yeah, you're so supporting the social net, the broader social network, those trusted adults kind of, and um, first they're educated about the problems that the youth uh, is um, going through their diagnosis, their treatment plan, uh, and they're sort of um, coached on how to talk to the kid, how to be supportive um, and how to, if where possible, uh, encourage the kid to make um, positive, uh, the child to make um, positive behavioral choices. And interestingly enough, that has been shown to reduce deaths, suicides and overdose deaths when we follow kids for a long time. So we're trying to make that more available. It's currently not available. Um, it's not paid for by insurance because it's um, kind of unique. Like I said, it's not actually treating the the adolescent directly. So we've been uh, piloting it with grant work and seeing if we can work with insurance companies to expand and make more accessible treatments like that. Um, So it's a long-winded answer, but that that gives you kind of an example of what we're trying to do. And if individuals are chronically at risk, then they need, they really should be working with a mental health professional who has experience, um, is trained in some of the um, evidence-based approaches for, um, and by that evidence-based approaches, I mean something that's been shown in rigorous studies to decrease repeat suicide attempts uh, or deaths, um, suicide deaths. So 
um, that's the sort of, yeah, the gold standard. And um, we've got a long way to go to make that more accessible to, um, you know, across the country, including New York, but I, I think we're making progress. Well, finally, if someone is in crisis and they need help now, I know they can call 988, but are there other uh, lifelines or means of accessing resources that you would encourage uh, or, or direct people toward? Absolutely. Uh, I think 988 really is a game changer, though. It's really kind of once in a generation opportunity uh, for us to get this right and, and develop uh, a, a robust sort of behavioral health crisis um, system. And it's not just the call center. So there, there's kind of the ideal system is typically characterized um, by, um, you know, having someone to call. Those are the call centers at 988. Someone to come. Uh, mobile crisis teams have, are being stood up across the state and somewhere to go. Short-term uh, crisis respite and uh, uh, centers are also uh, crisis stabilization centers are, uh, New York State is putting money into developing. That's really the vision for a comprehensive system. Um, and 988 is kind of the entry point with a, a, lot, a lot of crisis, crises can be resolved with uh, and don't require more intensive services. But for those that don't, um, that's where mobile crisis teams and crisis um, stabilization centers, all things that New York State is, is really supporting with the support of the governor and the legislator, uh, $60 million uh, beginning in 2024 being pumped into the 988, broader 988 system. And we already know, we already saw a 45% increase compared to the same period um, uh, last year. So in the brief, you know, since, since July, the launch, so really August, in the month of August, we're talking about, uh, we've already seen a, quite a, a big increase there. So we need to build, continue to build capacity, which we're doing in New York State. Um, another platform that we've worked with and partnered with is the crisis text line. Users tend to be um, younger, on, on like 75% or um, 24 and under. You know, obviously text, this is where you can get gain access, 24-7 access to a trained but volunteer uh, text-based crisis uh, counselor. And so if individuals are in distress, they can at any time um, text got five, as in G-O-T, the number five, um, to, uh, if you text that to 741-741, that gets you into the crisis text line uh, um, platform. And so a volunteer will, uh, a trained counselor uh, will engage that person and provide uh, crisis support. And so uh, I think 143,000 uh, individuals have taken it taken advantage of that um, already. Um, so it's a, a well-established system uh, that seems to be uh, uh, very helpful to many people, um, particularly younger uh, people. And so we're partnering with schools to do the Got5 Challenge and uh, students have been uh, creating videos to just raise awareness about this uh, platform that, that seems to get, high, you know, that gets, uh, high ratings from most users. And, and um, so we, we've been, um, you know, encouraging and supporting and, and providing marketing toolkits for communities and uh, schools across the state to uh, promote that, to, to just make sure people know about it. So thank you for asking. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, though. Uh, we've been speaking with Dr. Jay Carruthers, director of the Suicide Prevention Center in the state's Office of Mental Health. Dr. Carruthers, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And for listeners who are interested in getting training from the Office of Mental Health to help them detect warning signs for people who might be in distress, they can send an email to spcny.training at omh.ny.gov. That email again is spcny.training at omh.ny.gov.
Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and health care. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.